Okay, Cyrus says from the glistening fountain area, South Mumbai, where the money used to be. <laughs> it's all gone to BKC. We've got a very interesting guest today. The word I use every time, Manu S. Pillai. He'll come on in a second. I'll talk all about him. The whole show is dedicated to him. Manu, a lot of respect. But you're hanging there for 30 seconds while I rant about this huge problem. I've spoken about it before. Indian men in urinals take too long to wash and wash too much. So I actually timed this guy in the studio the other day because after peeing, he went into the basin and then he washed everything from head to elbows. I mean like elbows and everything else. And I put it on stopwatch. It was 53 seconds. 53 seconds. Then I timed myself 1.5 seconds because frankly speaking, you need to use the two fingers that hold the extended organ. And I use extended loosely. All right. You really don't need more than that. If you're very gifted, maybe three, but that's it. But he cleaned everything. And this happens all the time. They clean their face, their eyes, their nose, their ears, and their arms up to their elbows. It's always up to the elbows. It's not fingers. 53 seconds of my life stolen by that man. God, but I'll rant about it later because I can't waste Manu's time. He's a very important man. He's won many big awards, some of which I can't pronounce. That's how big they are. Uh, let's bring in Manu S. Pillai, author and historian. Uh, quickly to tell everybody, hi, Manu. You're looking, hi. I must say, resplendent. Um, oh, really? to see all I, the just, I just came out of my workout and I'm pretty sweaty. But anyway. No, it's it's not the workout thingy. It's the the books in the background. Those things oh, that, my kids yeah. have never heard of. You know, these <laughs> things with letters inside and all. And I'm, I'm trying to preserve a few so 50 years from now, people will say, "Book? What is that?" You know, and then you take a look and show them. But you're all about it, so it makes a lot of sense. I must say, authors are getting younger and younger. Oh, yeah, I'm getting older. Yeah, theory for relativity, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but you when you were young and you're in school and stuff, you always think of authors as wise old people. I can't think of any young author ever visiting us or, you know, or you think of the authors and you, you study them and research them. They're always old. Mark Twain is for forever 10,000 years old with like hair all over the place. And for example, just to name one, since I've not read that much. Manu, quickly, for those who, uh, the two people who don't know you, we have 10 people listening. The Ivory Throne, 2015 was the first book, then Rebel Sultans, then The Courtesan, The Mahatma and The Italian Brahmin. I dare say that sounds a controversial title. And um, uh, now we're on False Allies. Uh, which is the fourth book. So can we just quickly go into the life and times of Manu S. Pillai? How did you become a writer? And we'll talk about all four books if we can in the next, what, 10 minutes? Yeah, largely by accident because, you know, nobody tells you when you're growing up that you can be a writer. I mean, usually, even after class 10, when I took up arts to study, my my family, my extended family were like, oh, you know, kids who don't do well in school go into, the, in, into arts. Why are you picking up arts? I had a very good science score, but I was very interested in that. But obviously, again, you know, there's no question of... I was very interested in history as well. So once you let me get this no, right. Uh, you, you were good at science because what yeah. you said is absolutely true. My generation, I think I'm one before you. If you didn't do well, you went into arts. That was the yeah. only reason. There was no other reason. <laughs> That's what my, my aunts and uncles said. And they thought secretly my parents were lying about my grades. But the, the ah. fact was that I was not interested in science. And, you know, I, I hated maths. I, I've actually scored... Maths I sucked at because I once scored, I think, half on on 40 in a paper and then they gave me 10 for attending the exam and therefore 0.5 uh, yes 0.5 it was that bad because I, I wrote one answer and then i left the exam hall and Are then you I, really Malayali? Exam. I thought you guys had match from, from, from <laughs> no, the not all Malayalis. not all, yeah. Malayalis. all my yeah. malu pal i don't think one of them is bad in maths it's just not possible <laughs> what the no, hell my mother was great in maths but the thing is i i really sucked and then i bunked my term end exam so by the end of it i had 11 marks on 150 which is when i ditched maths and then moved to history and said, look, I really can't do this, and and, and took on history. And Which clearly, is, you know, ironically, filled with maths. Well, at least dates. Yeah, well, dates, for yes. yeah. Although, to be fair, you know, writers like me try to make it less about the dates and more about the people and the, the, the fascinating True. stories and things like that. So that more I think that's what the mistakes are, uh, our teachers have made, uh, going from your point, is that they have made it too much of dates and sort of very dry in that sense. Yeah. You know, like 1789 Bastille or whatever. And then the, the, the whole Bastille has lost. You're only trying to remember the date of when yeah. it happened. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, maybe that was a mistake, would you say? That is a mistake. I think, I think it sort of dulls history down into these like very, you don't connect with it. It's just these random things that happen at random times and you forget that history was actually made by human beings. And it's always easy to connect to human beings rather than to dates. You no, know, also we're connecting the wrong uh, thought process. We're thinking of the date, which is yeah. more important, when it's actually the philosophy, the social yeah, upheaval, the, the transformation, yeah. the event. That was, it should be the other way. And forget the damn date. You get it wrong yeah. also. Yeah. Which, of course, our present politicians get wrong all the time. Be it <laughs> Alexander's entry to, you know, who won the second battle of Panipat or third battle of Panipat for that matter. Anyway, yeah. uh, coming back uh, to this whole thing. So you, you want to be a writer and this was against the grain. The family was not very keen, obviously. 
So, so my parents actually never stood in the way. The extended family was very taken aback. Parents never stood in the way. You know, they they were in that sense old fashioned parents, which is that bache hoga you now you grow up. You know. Uh, oh, they wash their hands off. Yeah, you will feed you, dress you, that kind of thing. But they were not actively involved in. Oh my God, you must be a doctor. You must be an engineer. My parents. That was good actually. My parents gave my sister and me room to just become who we wanted to become, um, and you know that was that was useful. And then I didn't think I would be a writer. It's just that I came across a fascinating story at the age of eighteen. This historical figure who's the protagonist of my first book, and I thought, you know, gosh, this is an amazing story. And as as most people in two thousand eight who were in their teens uh, did, I had a blog that five people read. And I wrote a little article about this character, and then suddenly, so, so, so you know our podcast. You mirrored that completely, spot on. Even the figures are correct. Uh, irony yeah. again about the dates. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, and then the thing is, you know, this was pre-trolling and all of that. Internet was still pretty benign and nice. People used to send each other funny forwards. That was the era. And then, strangely, for this article, I got a lot of flack, like random people commenting on my ten-person uh, blog, uh, saying that you know, how dare you write this? This is not true, and all of that. And I realized, hold on, if a random kid sitting in blood, I'm sorry, in Pune, uh, does a blog post on this on this historical. Are you going to say bloody Pune? Yes, I, I almost. Oh, please that. do! Come on, this is a podcast is in place where you can be a little free. <laughs> you put you on no, television no, and it's surgically I've... remove everything. No, it's I've become like, far too free. Facing Pune. <laughs> no, no, I've become far too free recently. I'm actually appearing on camera in a in a t-shirt, which I never used to do a year ago. The pandemic yeah. has changed far too many things. Anyway, so then uh, I wrote this blog post, and then people attacked me, and I was like, you know, at the age of eighteen, if you're told not to do something, you're going to do the exact opposite. So I decided to dig into the story, and then for six years I worked on that book, and it was in parallel to my studies, to my first couple of jobs, oh, wow. all of that, and then the book came out. And I think the the book did really well, which is when I realized, hold on, I could actually do this and and make a living out of it and enjoy it. You know, I don't need to have another career and then juggle a book project uh, all the time side by side. I can just become a writer. So, question before we go to Ivory Throne, um, do you think the controversy is not a bad thing then in the end of the day? Because you look at say someone like Salman Rushdie, Midnight Children, probably my generation, of course, we were brought up on all this, so we have to know it. But I'm sure everyone will remember Satanic Verses in subsequent generations, yeah. but nothing else. Yeah. So in a yeah. sense, he remains immortalized yes. across cultures and languages. I'm saying people will remember satanic verses because of yeah. the controversy. So controversy well, actually is... bumps up sales. And people, you know, people. It's, it's, it's banned star. in India, but as if as if it's really banned in India. It's very easy to find yeah. copies of that book. <laughs> There's uh, no such thing. The There's no such thing as banned in India. Do you want yeah. Daru in Gujarat? Come with me. Yes. <laughs> yes. He takes two minutes. Yeah. 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 No, I, 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 I was just asking. Controversy helps to a certain extent, but then it can also backfire. That same. First book also ended up getting me a defamation notice, and in your twenties, getting a five crore defamation notice is wow. is not a very pleasant experience. But Are you know, ego ki baat hai, not bad, yeah. Five crores for a twenty-year-old, come on, not bad. No, you, no, it, it you, was late twenties, but yes. <laughs> Late twenties, still twenties. You, the poison chalice. Fair enough. Uh, let, let's quickly talk about the ivory throne. Then, in a couple of lines. So, this was a story that took you six years to bring to print. Yeah, yeah. It was about this last female Maharaja of Travancore. And you know, when women ruled in Travancore, they were they were not called maharanis. When whoever sat on the throne was called a raja. So these women were also maharajas. And it was about these two sisters who were both maharanis, except that one had the male heir, the other ruled till the male heir grew up. And their power politics. And the thing is, you you hear a lot of historical figures who are men and their power politics. But to see a protagonist and an antagonist who are both women. and who are sort of owning that power and sort of you know fighting it out in a darbar in the 1920s while also governing well while also doing black magic while also doing all kinds of other things uh it was a fascinating story it just taught me that in india beyond the nationalist struggle beyond the, the usual narrative that we get there are so many stories all over the place and so many fascinating rich characters who did such weird but interesting things and you could connect with all of them because they were all human beings they were not these historical figures in court sitting on a pedestal you know they uh, had all kinds of like affairs and all kinds of like thing, things that we human beings do even today there was nothing uh, you know lord curse I mean, the point of being the maharaja court maharani if you can't have affairs i mean that's, really <laughs> come on for god's sake that's fair no yeah. no and what was fascinating is how much the british kept records on all of this because you think the british empire was on about reality issues yeah on all of this because you you would imagine everybody sits down at a table and everybody is very dignified but no knowledge is power so you're constantly spying on the rajas you know finding out where they're going who they're sleeping with what they're eating all of this because that wow. access to knowledge about these people gives you a degree of control over them 
the birth of the famous tabloid the sun one of the worst newspapers in the history of the english language comes from the old uh, collections of the of, of the east india company keeping an eye on our rajas and ranis <laughs> that <laughs> i don't know but, but the of bad behavior was, but the east india company and the british were a huge vacuum sort of hoovering machine for gossip all across india the viceroy would get uh, fortnightly reports on all the gossip that was happening and you know ultimately also, knowledge we, is about what you're hearing right about what and we also are forget saying. i think that kerala is a land of kings and queens you know uh, right up till almost independence and beyond uh, some, somewhat uh, forgotten sometimes because of the dominance of the north in politics and history yeah. and uh, pushing out the agenda from three four states and stuff like that but you're right so that's really fairly interesting that uh, you know we have all this political intrigue going on so just to understand so the two sisters hate each other who are, they, who are, uh, who are the regions? they were originally fond of each other but the thing is once they got married once the sort of race to produce an heir came into the picture oh. and once power came into the picture that's what power does to everybody right you know you forget who your relatives are and it becomes about about possessing that object and that yeah, is, like and at the, the end of it one sister the the in quotes the the antagonist of the story she triumphs and the protagonist leaves the palace leaves the state and dies in obscurity 30 years later in bangalore and you know is one gets a, a, a gun salute when she dies the other is cremated in an electric crematorium it's very much if you've seen the the netflix show the crown it's a little bit like that 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 very complicated relationship between sisters where one is thrust into the limelight and the other resents it and you know all of that, that and you think that it wouldn't be an all or nothing story if you're born into the you know in, into regality and all this that you could still be the runner up so to speak you know there's no need for you to land up in bangalore in a pauper's grave etc i mean that's a really i mean that's terrible that it's like double no, jeopardy I mean, you go from I mean, to zero no the thing is she was harassed quite intensely you know like the no control over your own household no control over who your staff are uh, no control on who manages your affairs which means you're constantly watched you feel like you're actually so from the outside world you're sitting in a palace and you're very privileged but inside every person employed in your palace is a potential spy you can't speak freely in your own house because you don't know who's reporting uh, no, back to the other actually system. there is that like paranoia that happens to the person no no or, there's, or there's actually evidence. filled with spies you know there's actual evidence on on this and and again because the british kept such strong records you know exact times exact periods when her palace was taken away from her control new managers were appointed she wasn't allowed to stay where she wanted to stay allowances were stopped in case she mis- she didn't listen to what the uh, the the other palace was saying you know the, the conflict is and the thing is it really tells you about how power operates even today you know it it can get very petty even people who on the face of it would seem very secure and powerful can sometimes have these very petty ego clashes because human beings are human beings and that's why i said if you look through history and just trace all the human beings you can connect with history far better because they're just like us uh, they may live in different times and contexts but ultimately we're made of the same bundle of contradictions a sad commentary on the british they land up uh, in the famous phrase of i'll tell your father about you man which yeah. is what really happens this is yeah. so sad is a list of blackmailing uh, sort of files that they've kept which now as you mentioned it seems to be the most important thing in politics probably still and, there all over the world and of course when they left india they destroyed the all the copies that were there in india because they didn't want the maharajas to be exploited or back, blackmailed by the congress party after independence but in london all these secret files still exist therefore you can still go to london so they could still pull the strings from there from there if they want to be yeah well couldn't get the manchester test to be played so obviously the files are lost as far as i'm concerned but let's move on where we got uh, three other books let's quickly go through uh, two and then hit false allies so uh, rebel sultans yeah that Now is the history not. of the deccan sultanates you know deccan is oh, basically is this whole uh, telangana maharashtra karnataka that zone and usually when people talk about it it's either about the marathas or the moguls and i grew up here in pune so you know the thing is we had these cameo appearances by the previous islamic sultanates that were there and i was like why, why aren't we talking more about it and the more i read about it the more fascinating it was and fascinating colorful characters ibrahim adil shah the second with red nail polish uh, sunni muslim but calls himself son of saraswati and ganapati uh, there's really? an african yeah i mean you i don't know if you've been to ahmed what do we have his statue up as a secularist <laughs> no th- and that's the thing he was a contemporary of akbar's and he was very similar to akbar trying to sort of you know engage in a lot of unify the things. yeah yeah in ahmednagar which is a sort of tier 2 town today people don't know that there were black begums there were at least two sultans who had black wives that before shivaji decades before shivaji the person standing between the moguls and the conquest of the deccan was an african man called malik ambar um the the, the slave dynasty, yeah. Yeah, yeah slaves and uh, he was a ex slave then he became the warlord and a king maker people don't talk about the fact that the ahmednagar sultans were brahmins who converted but they became shias so they would send their bodies to be buried in karbala in iraq 
it, it's the stories again are just just utterly remarkable just fascinating characters of course uh, lots of trauma and tragedy as well you know when somebody kills his enemy gets his his meat his his flesh sort of removed from the body and cooked in biryani and then like there's all kinds of rather and, violent and things happening as well well and consumed the biryani was say, is said to have been sent to the wife of the dead man but hopefully nobody consumed it so uh, people could but she knew cool. that her husband's body parts are in the biryani the one hopes what you know, i know a few wives who would have eaten it happily damn you <laughs> uh, rajesh at last <laughs> i got you where i want you ding <laughs> okay uh, so that's a wide opening and then we go through this uh, i'm very fascinated i wish i had read a, a good anchor would have read everything before calling you on the courtesan the mahatma and the italian brahmin what the yeah. hell is that that's a connection of essays actually i'll tell you about the italian brahmin you know again fascinating character it was this italian called roberto de nobili who was from this italian aristocratic family became a jesuit father and came to india to convert indians to christianity he was not happy with the fact that the portuguese and this is all in the 17th century he was not happy with the fact that the portuguese were only converting uh, fishermen and people on the coast he wanted to really go into the interior and convert brahmins he wanted like the cream of indian hindu society and when he gets there he realizes that as long as i'm being seen as a foreigner this isn't going to work so he starts wearing saffron robes he acquires a punul or a sacred thread like a brahmin he learns sanskrit he learns tamil he starts sitting on the floor and eating out of plantain leaves but he, he looks like he, an italian he's he's white but he completely becomes a sadhu in in okay. externally and people treat him as a sadhu you know when he when he goes into royal courts they wash his feet they they seat him on leopard skin and tiger skin and things like that and he becomes this brahminized italian who starts preaching the bible as the, as a lost veda and and succeeds in converting lots of people uh, to christianity wow. which is why even now a lot of tamil catholics the fathers will wear saffron robes they'll have tikas and so on because that that has continued so he localized the whole flavor and gave yeah. it a mix and match approach which today if you look at corporates who've done well in india you know, i'm going back to mtv early days that was the whole hmm. approach localize how do we localize yeah. how do yeah. we and you know uh, entice people wow what, what yeah you you're, you're basically saying you you can take our religion but you don't need to change your culture you don't need to change your clothes you don't need to change what you eat you can keep all of that right down to your brahmin sacred thread but you're christians now so, so you know, he's not even changed it because he's saying it's a lost veda so in a sense it's an extension yeah. of your religion yeah yeah i i, I would buy it completely if he, if he was a good speaker people like yeah. me get converted to left right and center we have no idea where to go um okay, yeah, so that was a collection of essays on on people like that on courtesans you know but uh, these are all and, true stories right yeah they're all historical figures a couple of famous italians nicolo manucci and a couple of others mm. so they all went up north so there were many of those who actually went down south as well and uh, played a important role is it you know the, the, that's the thing most of the action did happen in the south because the, the north is landlocked the south is where the peninsula is which is where lots of traders lots of foreigners were drawn to the, it was the south that they were drawn in such large numbers a lot of colonialism began in the south it wasn't i mean bengal eventually was the big uh, conquest but much of it was originally happening in the south even for the the battle of plassey in bengal where did the army come from from madras you know to defeat the nawab of bengal uh, it's just that because power even today sits in delhi everything is a little sort of delhi oriented everything is a little north oriented and we forget that the south had its own uh, very italians italians I, I also a new yes. title for you the south has its own italians, italians uh, sonia yeah. gandhi to note <laughs> manu <laughs> s pillai's next book okay um, let's get to the uh, the new ones so uh, false allies is this a more contemporary sort of book No, the false allies is about the princely states in India. It just came out a week ago, and it's about the fact that we think of Maharajas, and all we think is oh, fancy palaces, luxurious silks, pearls, and people having a lot of wine and never working. Hobbies. I never was. Oh, yes, yes. But <laughs> but the fact is that you know that's actually a caricature the British created. In reality, the Maharajas were actually pretty fascinating people. Mysore had you know factories and iron works, steel works, one of the biggest dams in the world, uh, gold mines, all of that. uh the the travanco maharaja set up an educational infrastructure which is why kerala is still uh, highest literacy in the, in in the country and you know it it, it it's not a so place you think it you goes can, back it goes back 300 years goes back, it goes back to royal control uh, from the 19th century onwards not all the way back but from at least the 19th century in the colonial period the rajas were not idiots you know they realized that the british had certain clichés about them and some of them actually countered those clichés quite successfully many of them were funding the congress party you know your dada bhai nauruji who won that that election to the house of commons in parliament he was his election was funded by a lot of maharajas because they had an incentive in sending a an indian into the into the houses of parliament in london and making a political statement so you know there's there's they were not idiots and they were not 
not political creatures. They were also politicians. Just because they wore silks, we've sort of reduced them to uh, what are you know in quotes effeminate scoundrels, as a, as an Englishman said. But that was not. Yeah, you're right. Actually, we do think of them as effet and you know doing nothing and charlatans and all that. Yeah. 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 How sad. You've changed my perspective already in just two minutes. I should have fought harder. <laughs> yeah. So what you're saying is we had quite a few visionaries who actually fought back, tried to change the kind of uh, image that was portrayed about them and also were good with their own people. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, when we think of fought back, we generally think you have to get on the street and like fight a, a mass uh, agitation or a mass protest. That's the kind, that's the only way to do it. But the thing is, these guys were ruling 40% of the country, which was not under direct British control. The British tried to control them, but their governments Correct. were Indian governments ruling over Indians and trying to achieve things. And their states were seen as proper, legitimate political spaces. Like The British could not intervene in their states officially. Of course, they did, but there was always pushback for those things. And yes, many of the Maharajas delivered standards that were far higher than what the British could, could deliver in their own territories. Because the British were ultimately foreigners, you know, whereas the Maharajas still depended on their people, they still depended on uh, on keeping the loyalties of their people and they had to not and we assume that somehow the British are dealing with the Rajas and the Rajas are in full control. No, the Rajas have internal factions, they have internal balances of power that they have to maintain. So it's actually pretty political everything that's happening. Uh, Raja is not so, sitting in a darbar hall uh, drinking wine and issuing arbitrary orders every two seconds. He's got, you know, my, my grandmother grew up in a princely state and in her in her state, you know, for the first 10 years of her life, her father was a schoolmaster. They had lower caste teachers. The government used to supply not just benches and textbooks, but milk powder for the children. Uh, there were, the government officials used to come and collect the taxes. It was not a local feudal lord or anything. There was a sophisticated government infrastructure that was already there. Uh, you know, people were paid pensions. Everything was very organized. It was not some kind of backward feudal uh, situation. Manu, you've convinced me. Cancel democracy. Let's go back to monarchy. We no, no, no. Not that's not the argument chance. of the book, though, by the way. Uh, the no, book but... doesn't glorify them. There were bad eggs among them also. It's just that all I argue is that we don't, we shouldn't reduce them to stereotypes and caricature. You know, what they achieve. And, and one doesn't speak seen... for all. Yes. But, yeah. but, but false allies, are we talking about the perspective of uh, Britain to India? Or India to uh, the Indian rulers to the Brits? Who are the false so the allies? Thing... So the thing is, the British always framed the Maharajas either as idiots who they needed to control or as allies and pillars of the British Empire. And the Maharajas also on the face of it said, oh yes, we are wonderful allies of the British Empire. But the, the moment the British back was turned, they would try to sort of, you know, needle the British in their own ways. An example is, you know, in the 1870s, there was this Raja in Indore. Uh, and he wrote this groveling letter about how India was a heap of stones and then the Raj came and sort of built this wonderful edifice with its railways and the English language and all that. Now, if you read it on the face of it, you're like, oh my God, what a slavish you know, man. He's completely a, a loyal ally of the British. But look at the internal British correspondence and he's actually described as one of the most disloyal uh, uh, princes in India who presents the British with persistent opposition. That's their internal correspondence, which is that they also knew that what he's showing in public is not what is his actual sentiments are and what he's doing behind the scenes. And a lot of Rajas did this. You know, Lord yeah. Curzon found out that Maharaja of Baroda was happily sponsoring the Congress party, uh, giving them regular funding and so on, because he wanted Congress to sort of add pressure on the, on the British from the other side. Uh, and for the longest time, this is a thing. Till the 1930s, even the Congress and the Rajas were actually friends. Gandhi used to call you know, the various rulers Raja Rishi, compare their kingdoms to Ram Raja. The Maharani of Travancore was like Lakshmi. And he said, oh, her simplicity is even more, uh, she's even more simple than I am. So Gandhi also respected the, the states for the longest time and the rulers of these states. So, so there's a lot of cunning there, you know, again, which we don't attribute to our so-called lazy kings of the last 200 years. Uh, yeah. Cunning, intrigue, deceit, if you like, Machiavellian sort of thought uh, in justifying the means, playing the other person. Uh, so, my God, that's, that's amazing. I have no idea that we had all this going for us. So, and, no, and the thing is, these guys also manipulated the British quite well. You know, for example, you could bribe, so every court would have somebody called a British resident, like a British agent. Some Rajas and Ranis used to treat the agent like shit, you know. So Maharani Baisabai of Gwalior, the British agent comes very hoity-toity, thinks he's going to be received as a VIP. She sends out nobody to receive him, makes no supplies for his kitchen. He ends up in a, in a dark, cold house because nothing's been ready for him. And in her darbar, she treats him as a complete non-entity. Uh, British, you know, uh, in, in, another, in another state, they would often bribe these British residents. And just as the Rajas were watching, the British were watching the Rajas and who they were sleeping with, the Rajas could also watch who the British were sleeping with. 
So, you know, in the 1920s, there was a... What if they slept a... with each other? That would be confusing. Also I mean, happened. Sure. By the way, yeah. I'm not naming names, but also happened. So, whose file does that go into, Manu? <laughs> Nobody's file. That, that just, survives an oral they, history. <laughs> oh! <laughs> they complete, they complete and, coitus and they say, excuse me, and both pick up their papers, jot down a few then, notes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but that's wow. the thing. You know, a lot of people kept private diaries. So, even a British resident, he sent an official report to the Viceroy, but the letter he'll send to his mother often has more details, more texture. And because the British are great at this, you know, they've got these private papers in their archives. We also do, but we've usually got them for very well-known figures. In England, I found in the archives, even relatively obscure characters, you can donate your papers to. And if you even held a single decent political position, you can donate your papers. And my God, you know, I found this residence letters to his mother. It's so much like juice and gossip about what was happening in the court. And, and there was this one resident in Travancore in the 1920s whose name was Mr. Cotton. And there's a saying in Trivandrum to this day, which is in Madhyalam, beddil cotton on door, which means does your bed have cotton, which on the face of it sounds like a cotton mattress. But the idea is that this man used to jump from bed to bed of the local women. Ooh. And it's, it's resulted in this in this local phrase. Uh, they they used to have mistresses. Wow, locally. he's immortalized in Malayalam for he's his sexual dances. Amazing. Yes. I mean, I mean, <laughs> England should I mean, this guy's statue should come up in both countries. Yeah. 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 And and you know, the Rajas watched them, they would find out if they had illegitimate children, uh, they would offer jobs to some of them, they would bribe the residents. Some residents were taken aback. There was a Maharani of Indore who sent uh, a fruit basket to a resident with gold coins concealed in it. And when he he was like, oh my God, are you trying to bribe me? How dare you? And all of that. She said, what? You were expecting more? <laughs> you know, is it just about wanting a little bit more? I can, I can arrange that. So, you know, there was a lot of counter manipulation going on. Sometimes one wing of a royal family could use the British against another wing of the royal family. Sometimes the British could use internal dissensions in a princely state to create trouble for the Raja. Uh, and this this goes down to politics. So you don't like a particular Raja. The British resident will ally with all the Darbaris and the, the politicians in the state who hate the Raja and sort of orchestrate a rebellion from below. And they'd say, oh, look, Raja can't even control his own government. We must remove him and replace him with a new Raja. And Rajas would also you know, try and counter this in their own way. So it was not a case of these people being meek or passive. There was actually a lot of stuff happening. And small details, like, you know, people say, oh, they were so obsessed with small ritual and ceremony and these petty little things. But all of these had political meanings, you know. So if a British resident came, depending on how the, the British relationship with the state had evolved, that where should the chair of the resident be kept in a darbar? Should it be next to the throne, which signifies equality? Should it be on the right side, which signifies respect? Or should it be on the left side, because the left is a little lower than the right? And then the British would argue. Definitely, so we, we must be on the definitely right. in India must... right now. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good line. Yes. So you know, there's even small things have a lot of political meaning, which uh, we don't always recognize on the face of it. In in reality, you know, little things like where a chair is kept may seem petty, but these were all loaded with political meanings. Sometimes at pujas in the palace, the British resident would insist that Queen Victoria's portrait must be kept on the nearest wall so that she's also present in 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 token you know, form over there. But Manu, that's still uh, that's still there today. You know, I mean, it's a little different, not so much about the chair, but where you're sitting next to whom, when the photos yeah. are taken, who's next to whom. They still do all that. And the attaches are always constantly fighting because the bow factor depends yeah. on these little, little things. And yeah, it, yeah. It, probably diplomatic relations get, uh, I wouldn't say go askew, but definitely go up and down because of this. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously nothing has changed. L listen, we'll run out of time, so I want to quickly end with the... Uh, some meaty stuff as well. Uh, hmm. People would know, but following your education, you worked with the parliamentary office of Shashi Tharoor yeah. in New Delhi. And yes. then also <laughs> with Lord Karan Billamori in London. So if we could just get a couple of minutes on each. First, Shashi Tharoor. Uh, I'm a big fan. Um, and also, I, I think a lot of Indians are, even if they won't admit it in public in the present environment. But yeah. go ahead, tell us. No, so the thing is, I had finished studying in London. And the thing is, in those days, what I wanted to work on was foreign policy. As I said, I, I didn't realize writing could be a career and I could actually do history as a full-time thing. So I thought, okay, foreign policy or whatever. And I still remember I was heading back from London after my master's. And in the airport, I was boarding the Bombay flight. And I saw Dr. Zarur boarding the Delhi flight. And I was like, hey, I know him. I'm going to write a letter and write an email and see if he has an internship to offer. So I came back and a couple of days later, I sent an email and he basically liked the email. I had nothing on my CV. I just, I'd never worked. I'd never done an internship, nothing. 
but he liked the way I drafted my email, and he said, "Oh, you know, you write well. Come see me in Trivandrum." What did you say in the email? What, what would be the nothing? Just asking for for an internship. But I think he's also a writer, right? So I think he just liked the way I structured the email. You see, he's like the style. There was no, the content wasn't really content. There was no content. Like, <laughs> there was no. Content. I thought you said, "Dear Shashi, love your hair." Something like that. You know, <laughs> it leaves a mark immediately. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I was I was very honest about not having any experience, but simply wanting to work with him. So then I met him in Trivandrum, and he said, "Come, you can do an internship at my office." Uh, well, luckily for me, a, a month later, the gentleman who was running that office left. And in those days, his office was just a, a clerical gentleman who had come from the government service, and the other chap. And once the other chap left, I got offered the role within a month. So I was bumped up a little bit. And then from there, I sort of built the team. Uh, and now it's, I think, a ten-member team, if I'm not wrong, with interns and like there's a whole uh, set of people. Then, then there's a parliamentary office, there's a committee office. Uh, you know, because he's part of he's he's head of various committees in Parliament. Uh, so well, that he's was part one. One Congress member of Parliament who continues to win and have a voice, uh, while the rest of them are getting buried. Uh, oh, I don't, I don't mean that in any other way. <laughs> but, but tell us what 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 is he like? Is, is because you know I've done some events with him, had the privilege of meeting him a few times as well. Um, he's always fun. Uh, with us, of course, but you know, working maybe a different experience, and he's he's always very charming, and I think he's dynamite on stage. And I keep saying that the Congress missed a missed a really big one when they didn't push him right to the higher echelons of of power and maybe be the face of the Congress because I felt that he had that pan India presence, and he's just he's just the kind of guy who has the magnetic personality that attracts people, and you have to yeah. have some of that. It's the same yeah. thing with Trump, whether you like him or not. I mean that. Half the reason he was there is because he's Trump. Before you get into yeah. what Trump is really about, uh, yeah. of course, terrible comparison. I'm sure he wouldn't yes. like that. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. Trying to praise a guy, this is what comes out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, so yeah. the thing is, he's. I mean, the charm, the, the 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 speeches, and all of that is is one thing. But frankly, what I really admire is his capacity to just work hard. The thing is, most people don't see that because you know they see the public sort of version where there's all of this uh, this happening, and he seems to do it with great ease. But when I was doing my first book, the six years that I was working on that, that's when I also began working for him. And one of the things, and I would sit in the office till late in the evening after everything was done and work from the office desk itself. And I remember I could see the light in his study in the house, which was opposite. Uh, that would be on till two in the night, three in the night, and I used to treat it as a kind of motivational thing because I was like, if he can do it after achieving so many things in life, then I, at twenty-one, have no excuse but to sit here and and work. And he still does it. He just works a lot, like all the time. There's a lot of work in the car, you know, in the evenings while he's eating. It's constantly just dealing with work, and without complaining. I've never heard the man complain. I've never heard him get angry. Uh, I've never heard him be uh, rude but, to but, anybody. But he, if he shouts at you, would it be in Malayalam or English? Like, would he? But he's never shouted to... at me. He's never really? Shouted at me. Never loses never. his shape, as we no, say in cricket. I've never seen yeah. it. Maybe you know, during the election, sometimes pressures go up, but that was small things. You know, like people barging into his into his bedroom. The thing is, during an election campaign, your, your your house is taken over by people, right? It's full of people, visitors coming, going, and you can't say no. It's just that when they barge into your bedroom, you draw a line, and you're like, yeah. please, can I have my two hours of sleep? You know, you can't just do that. Small things like that, maybe I've seen him lose his temper, but nothing in never in any other in any other sense. You know, it's, it's, how do you rate his Oxford speech, which of course broke the internet, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. I was actually oh. there. I was I'm not in there. Oxford, but I was in Delhi, and and I was part of that that time when when all of that happened, and yeah. it was it was great fun. I think you know it, we were we, frankly to be to be honest though, uh, I don't think anybody expected it would go viral. It went vi I think the video came out quite some time mm -hmm. after the speech, and it went viral. After the speech was done, weeks after that, and so it took all of us first a little bit by surprise, and then of course it became a big deal and ended up in a book and all of that. Uh, none of it was planned; it, it sort of happened organically. Also, I think one of the great points about him is that, uh, unlike say some of the anchors on news channels, etc., horrible again comparison, is that he makes his point with a lot of intensity and energy, but never loses his shape, like you said. You know, he's not screaming ever or shouting ever. So there's yeah. a certain civility and decency to the presentation, which I think more sophisticated people immediately say, wow, now I want yeah. to listen to you. I was yeah. so used to theatrics and drama and melodrama and violence and aggression. And these are not qualities that are appealing to anybody who has half an education. So yeah. I, I do believe and that there are far more Indians who actually like his style than, than people think. They really yeah. are, because whatever events I've done with him, he has been the star. I will not name yeah. other people there, but you, including actors, film yeah. stars from Bollywood, etc. And he has been the star. He yeah. just—they just love him. He went to Campion School, his old school, of course, and 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 they wouldn't let him go. 
And the women mm. thought of him as a sex symbol. They were crazy about him. You know, he, he, he's yeah. really, I really feel if, if I could just speak to the Congress high command and just chat with them, Shashi Tharoor should be boosted up. And I think it'll make a big difference in 2023. Uh, really, um, or 24, whenever it is. Let's, 24, let's uh, hope so. Yeah. Let's hope so. Yeah. Anyway, uh, let's get a word on Karan Bilamori. I always want to know because I think he's mm. Barsi, but how does he have a name like Karan? That Karan I have to ask Indian. him. I think I think his parents, you know, may have just chosen it. I think his father's father's name was Faridun Bill Bill Emoria. There you so go. That's as far as you can get. Yes. So Karan <laughs> is a is a Kapoor like name or a Kanna like name. It's yes. one of those names you get up north mostly. Yes, yes. I don't know. So, I don't know the story behind Karan, but a uh, wonderful, wonderful man. You know, I think there's that. Whole but how do you land that job? Uh, you were I, already I, with Shashi. I was. I was. So the thing is, I was doing my first book also as I was working with Doctor. So I worked with him in three different stints, by the way. So there were gaps between them. So after a while of working with him, I needed to go back to London to work in the archives over there for my book. I'd already had one round of work there. I needed another round. So I thought, okay, now I need to go work in London. So uh, I got in touch with uh, Karan and wrote him an email. And he was looking for a, a research assistant at that time. And for me, it was a, a foot to in, in London. So I said, please, can I get this job? And we spoke on the phone and he hired me and I met him. Um, you know, there's that cliche, right? That the Parsis are very decent and it's very difficult to find among Parsis uh, a person who's not decent. And that cliche... I would suggest is is entirely true because he is the decentest person I know. Uh, you know, in and and the word decent fits him perfectly. You know, I've not seen a nasty bone. I've not seen pettiness. I've not seen anything. Uh, you know, ambition sometimes gives people a kind of negative thing as well. None of that. Very very. Power and position corrupts people generally. You'd expect it from powerful people. Just tend to become more obnoxious. You know, yeah, it just seems. Yeah. yeah. And he's very secure. He's very sort of. Uh, you know very in his element, very comfortable in his skin. And again, it was wonderful to work with somebody like that because frankly, I've never had a nasty boss. I've never in my life, and I've been self-employed for the last few years now. Switch parties. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I got a guy in UP. He's not yeah. known to be very friendly. Can, can I recommend yeah. him? <laughs> uh, no, thank you. I think I'm done with that phase of my life. So yeah. I'm not going to work Oh, how sad. Him, but... <laughs> but but that's really lucky. Both the gentlemen you mentioned seem to have, uh, you know, really, as you say, decent and civil amongst everything else, which is so rare. We've reached a point yeah. in the world history where, you know, these two qualities are so rare. You find them, yeah. you say, wow, this guy is good. Uh, last thing about Karan Bilamor, did you, did you, uh, did you get to attend parliament? I mean, obviously... I, I... You, you can go and like watch and all that. But, you know, frankly, I didn't go much into parliament because I mean, the frank truth is I was do, also doing my book, right? So I had a colleague who's very excited about parliament and I was more than happy to sort of let her uh, take a charge of that side of things because uh, that would sort of free me up to do some of my own things. I was still working weekends and we still had, uh, we used to work over the phone. Every time he was driving, he'd call me and then we'd do a, a bunch of things uh, over the phone. And I didn't mind that. But as Let far as me write that down. Lord Karim Bilamoria chatting on phone while driving. Hmm. No, no, no. You have that ear thing. No, like he's not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right, he's not like, like us Indians in traffic where you hold the phone and then drive with the other hand. While uh, talking to the cop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Excellent. Okay, that listen, Manu, you've, as before. usual, spoken far too much. I was expecting to take a uh, break 10 minutes earlier. But oh. fascinating stories and very interesting. It's called False Allies. Go and purchase that book ASAP if you want to know more about the real history of uh, India, uh, especially from the point of view of Indian royals, which perhaps has not been told. And, and you know, amazing, just as you're going to break, amazing, I think, is that you did this hard work, the what we call the legs of going to England, sorting out the archives to get a, possibly a, a more balanced perspective. Obviously, you did your research here as well. So, my God, it's too much hard work. And I would think that you become a writer because you can just sit on a desk and make things up. I mean, that's why I started <laughs> writing. You know, yeah. just change the history. Isn't there a government somewhere in the world who does that? Just just change it. Just make it up. <laughs> I mean, a lot of All people right. are trying to do that. I wish I was into that. But unfortunately, are you, are you I'm talking about the old the, the, thing. Oh, you're talking about those hybrid uh, history dramas, is it? That no, become... I'm talking about generally how so much like rubbish is peddled these days. And you just find a Wikipedia and you find some three other articles and you say that this is the truth. And it's Did you so know we had airplanes? You know we had airplanes in Vedic times? I've heard, I've heard. Yes, you you must open your eyes, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> open your my, eyes. My eyes have been colonized, clearly. That's why I can't <laughs> see it. All right. We don't have Lord Curran on the line, but we have someone who's also from royalty in Pawai, Mumbai, who'll join us just now as we take a break. Uh, Silvery, are you there? Yeah, sir. Here he comes. Uh, sir, we have an ad read. Oh, we have an ad read. Okay, so I have to now find the ad read. So that will That's take time. First, yeah. say hi, no? Hi, hi, Manu. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, hi. Nice okay, Manu, this is going to be an ad read, so you have to bear with us. Sure, sure. It's so... Are we ready? Yes. Okay. Well, Manu looks so pensive and in pain. Oh, it's no, just no, an no. ad. 
it's not the return of the british which some may accept as a good thought it's so difficult to understand so many things in the tech world not for manu but for me like artificial intelligence what is that it just sounds like science fiction doesn't it and then i'm supposed to do my fake laugh which i've now worked on all morning <laughs> and stay into camera like norm macdonald uh luckily though intel's digital readiness program empowers everyone with skill sets mindsets and tool sets to use in an ai fueled world so you don't end up like me this is my sacrifice the intel ai for youth program is an initiative that guides today's youth to an understanding of ai how it is designed and why it's important today intel's been working with the cbse ministry of education and the government of india to empower today's youth to build social impact solutions while demystifying what ai is how do you take advantage of this purchase an intel core powered pc and you can get free access to 80 plus hours of immersive and hands on training about ai this is something I, i'm the moment the show ends i'm going to do uh, on completion of the program along with a certificate you get access to ai tool sets to try to put what you learn to good use so don't wait log on to future bana wonderful uh, dot intel dot com Future banana wonderful by bringing home an Intel powered PC today. Uh, that's just an. We're not asking you to do that. That's just a suggestion. Let's. This, this is not fascist advertising. This is very democratic advertising. Uh, Manu, hmm. what's your take on AI? I don't know if I have a take on AI. I mean, if it makes research easier, great. You know, actually, there is. There's now this. I think it's a. It's a new iPhone where if you sort of you know scan it over a newspaper, it sort of picks up the text. I wish I had that in 2011. You know, all these. Like, what you do you mean? Know. So I can I can just scan it and I can read on my phone? Yeah, like it picks up just the text and like, like editable form. And I, I you can search with text, text also nowadays. Now, if you like scan ah, something, yeah, uh, and that's some something on like a piece of paper, you can scan it. You can scan the text and then you can just search from that text without having to type. Wow. You can also scan wow. by images now. If you look look uh, see an image that you like, you want to know yeah. what that image is of. You can just search yeah, through the know. image. That I know. I'm not yeah. that much of a dinosaur. I know that. I know about no, no. Uh, image search. I, I know Saris didn't know that. I know Saris for sure did not know yeah. that. <laughs> Every time you're in yeah. trouble, Sir, we don't insult me to yeah. get out of it. I mean, it's, it's, it's so out. easy. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, I hope AI comes up with something for dating, where you can just sort of, you know, cover the date a couple of times, swipe them left, right with the phone, and then you get all the information about what their preferences are so the date can end fast. You know, I wonder if they could do that. Really, we waste so much time in actual dating. Well, not me. I'm married now. I shouldn't be dating. But mm -hmm. uh, let's talk history. We're mm -hmm. with Manu for another twenty minutes. Uh, do we have AMAs? Yes. yes, we have tons of AMAs for Manu. The first one comes in from Tarun Kaushik. He says, uh, "Manu, love your podcast with Amit Varma. Without making it political, how do you think history helps students in the longer run? And do you think the NCERT needs to amend its history syllabus?" Yeah, I mean, frankly, I, I keep saying this. I have no faith about school textbooks and all of that because you basically tell these textbook writers that you have 50 pages and you have to compress Indian history into 50 pages. Obviously, you're going to get a terrible job done because it's not possible to do that. I think the, the better thing is that once you're older, you, you read books that people like me write. I've got four. Please buy all. And, uh, and that may give you a, a better sense of things or at least a better argument and a, and a more interesting take on history. Um, and uh, the rest was what? Without making it political, how does history help students in the long run? Well, the thing is, history tells you why the world is what it is at present. And you know, if, if you can't make sense of what the world is uh, at, at the current moment, then you can't necessarily also define what you want it to be in the future. There's there's plenty of evidence in history of people doing uh, making political decisions that are wrong, but because humans can always count on their own stupidity, we will keep repeating those mistakes. Whereas history can perhaps alert us that, hold on, you're making a mistake again. Uh, it, it won't stop idiots from making mistakes, but history can sort of uh, shed some light on, on these things. Ultimately, the present is built on history. You know, the shape of the country, why our politics is the way it is, why our institutions are the way it is, why the police reforms are not happening, why the judiciary is the way it is. All of this has justifications and explanations in history. And I think that's why you need to study history. It'll give you a sense of why we are as a people. Yeah, but Manu and Tarun, I would say, be careful about the phrase amended history syllabus. While we accept that going through dates and making it bland and boring was the wrong way to go, but that's that's a whole different argument. The worry is changing history, which yeah. uh, not yeah. just our country, but a few countries. You just can't do that. You yeah. give the devil its due. If you don't like one side or the other, the truth is this happened. The Holocaust happened. You can't say they never happened, which, you yeah. know, you have a few morons across the world who just insist it never happened. And in our case, I'm a little scared about how they're just reinterpreting Mughal uh, era, era history. Um, yeah. I don't yeah. know how bad it is with the, with the southern states, but, uh, you know, with the localized government coming to power and saying, I'll, I'd like to change this. This is what mm -hmm. happened in the battle. And this is what we, I mean, that's a little yeah. scary. That is scary. 
mean, and the thing is that that's scary because it may not impact us right now, but if this is being fed to kids from the age of say seven, eight onwards, uh, by the time they grow up, you don't know what they'll think. You know, they they they'll have all kinds of weird ideas about the past. I mean, imagine I, America. Yeah, sorry. No, I got black recently. You know, I was I did this article on the on uh, the Mapla Muslims of Kerala, and I gave this example of an old legend in which a sage called Vararuchi has a son who's a Muslim. He's got several sons. One is a Brahmin, one is a carpenter, one is a Muslim. And I, I cited this as evidence of how, you know, Muslims were sort of welcomed into local society and made part of the narrative there in Kerala. And somebody, a BJP politician on, Twitter, on Facebook the other day put up a post saying, as per my calculations, Vararuchi lived in the 4th century or the 5th century. Islam was only created in the 7th century. So you're lying when you say that. Uh, how is it possible? The chronology is all wrong. Firstly, I didn't write the legend. You know, I'm only interpreting what the legend is saying. Uh, saying. The legend's been there for ages. But the number of people who've been tagging me on social media as if you've been exposed, your credibility... But, but here's the rub. So he's upset because one of the kids is uh, Muslim. Uh, so yeah, hence he goes into all that. If, if you just mentioned they were Jain, Sardar and uh, Parsi, it wouldn't bother him at all and he would just gone on no. with his life. Yeah, but he there's some pettiness in that. Yeah. But his pettiness, <laughs> well, the thing is, it's, he doesn't understand that. Firstly, I didn't do the legend. I didn't invent the story. The character is already in the legend. The other thing is, legends are not chronological. You know, legends are not about that. Legends are communicating something completely different. Legends are not accurate footnoted history with like your page numbers and references and files. Uh, legends serve a completely different purpose. But you know, by framing it the way he did, by using this whole chronological argument, this is how fake news is created, right? It creates the impression of scientific credibility, even though actually trained historians know that what you're saying is dumb and it's not really true and it's rubbish. Uh, but and but a lot of people buy it, and you know, it's it's but it's part of the it's part of the business. I am I work with history. A lot of people are going to call me names, and that's part of the job. Yeah, this emotive thing is also irritating, I think, after some time, where the emotional reaction, which is fueled by whoever, and then you have a whole lobby that emotionally reacts, as in the case of satanic verses or whatever, you know, where, where they're not really involved in what the real specifics are, there's no yeah. research done, there's no question of actually knowing what you're talking about, it's like, you tell my father, I'm going to fight with you, I mean, that's just, you know. I, I yeah. think those kind of people should be just sent out of the country. It's just here's your passport. <laughs> no, Go no, find but, another country. but they want to send people like me out of the country. <laughs> I know, I know. I think. Don't worry, we'll keep that's, you here. We now we fight. <laughs> Manu, we draw the line in the sand. We fight now. We say enough is enough. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing. Oh, who says that they have the book on patriotism just because they that decide is... to interpret history than the way they do? No, that's yeah. it. We make uh, Shashi Tharoor the uh, next Prime Minister of India. Lord Karan Bilamoria comes in and makes <laughs> the cabinet, and it's like the like a sort of vice position. And Manu, you yourself can be education minister. Silvery, you can be uh, uh, women and child development because you've got a very humane side to you. Me, mm -hmm. I'll tour the world. It's been done before. <laughs> be <laughs> uh, Manu, Sorry. what do you think? What do you think about? Uh, so a lot of cities are changing, having their names changed. Do you think uh, doing that affects the the way we remember the city's history? Maybe? I mean, Kerala itself. The way we grew up with the Trivandrums and Cochin. Of course, yeah. Cochin, I mean, it's not that far away. But how important is it to Malayala, Malayalify it? Um, you know, is that a need? I mean, of... The thing is, there's a very logical argument to keep both, frankly. You know, like, I, I say Paris in English, but people in France say Paris. Right. Now, the thing is, they will, when they come to London, they'll say Paris. Like, they don't have to say Paris. Paris, you know, it, it, both are possible. Even now, people use Trivandrum. A lot of this is, is obviously political. So you're saying posturing. when you speak in Malayalam, it, it, it'll flow better to say yeah, the original word. Word. Poem when, is when fine you... for me in Malayalam. But Trivandrum, when I say English. Bombay in English. Mumbai, when I'm speaking, say I think that's, or Marathi. I've been saying whatever. the same thing, actually. That why really does it, that's... Yeah, why does it matter this, this much? But of course, I think this is part of a lot of what we call cultural assertion, which is that, look, yeah. uh, anglicized names must go... So many years have passed since independence. In fact, there's people who now say India as a word is also not uh, preferable. We should be using Bharat as opposed to India. Uh, but, you know, these these are, I think, at some level, not very urgent debates. You know, these things will keep happening uh, for different reasons. Of course, in some places, they'll keep changing names. I'm not entirely against it if people feel that it somehow reflects uh, their personality and their culture or whatever. But the thing is, it becomes a danda with which to then start yeah. targeting certain people and not others. You know, It's the aggression the related to it more than the actual yeah. changing of the name. As you said, yeah. from a practical point of view, absolutely spot on. What's the problem? No problem. Whatever yeah. the dialect is, the language flows. Mumbai, yeah. Bombay and Bombay in Hindi, yeah. they all Bombay. have their own way of, you know, it just flows by anyone yeah. who speaks those languages. Yeah. But anyway...
Like Hyderabad, Hyderabad, you know, some some people, some people want to name it Bhagya Nagar now. But the thing is, Hyderabad was founded by a Muslim king. He gave it that name. You want to find uh, have a Bhagya Nagar? Go invent a new city if you like. No, wh- why do you want to keep reclaiming somebody respect, else's like this? That's respect a- Alexander the Great. He just named everything after himself. He didn't waste time. <laughs> okay, we won. It's Alexander. Well, Alexandria. <laughs> just keep walking. <laughs> Next. Yeah. Also, also in the middle, there was this whole thing where uh, uh, people would get offended. Uh, if you said Bombay instead of Mumbai, right? Uh, people were like, how can you say Bombay? You colonial, no, 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 no. whatever. They, people didn't get offended. Politicians made people, you know, I mean, it's yeah, like exactly. for jobs, exactly what and, I mean. you know, yeah, yeah. infrastructure being looked at in education and health and all. You have louts on the road with nothing to do saying, Mumbai ka sign chahiye, Mumbai sign chahiye, they're Bombay nahi hai. Exactly. You know, that kind of thing. Like, yeah, that, people have to change the shop names and all. You remember? Like, yeah, was the whole that, thing. But those kind of bullies don't belong yeah. in any society. They're just louts. Yeah. I mean, it's just ridiculous that we yeah, just absolutely. even have this conversation, honestly. What a waste of time. You come to PA and you change names and build statues. I mean, come on, really? <laughs> That's the reason you're in PA. <laughs> yeah. I mean, five-year-old kid will do better than that, won't he? I mean, you give a five-year-old kid PA and say, at least build a sweet shop or something, which is of some service to somebody. <laughs> anyway, next question. All right, next one comes up from Girish Patil. Uh, he says, Manu, can you please talk about uh, the third battle of Panipat and Marathas in Har- Haryana and Baluchistan? There is a lot yeah, of unnecessary Abdali. chest thumping in Maharashtra, especially after Neera Chopra's gold. But they got hammered. Ah, frankly, I, right? I, I did read something about this, but I'm not entirely sure about what this this whole like community of Mar- Marathas or whatever who moved and then sort of settled in Haryana and became a kind of local caste and all of that. I've got very basic knowledge on this. I, I'm not a, an expert on the Marathas, so I don't want to say something and then make a fool of myself. No, but, but the third battle of Panipat, I mean, again, the result is clear. The yeah. Marathas won that. Yes, possibly we'll be speaking Marathi in Delhi and all that is fine. Uh, about the people who stayed behind and, you know, uh, adopted surnames from there or, or the names can be traced to Maharashtra. That's also fine. That happens all the time. But yeah. the battle was lost. Emma Shah Abdali triumphed and that's the story. Yeah. Uh, the problem is that they want to act like, oh, I mean, they've made movies about it and all. They sort of go for a gray area always, but there was no gray area. They, the, the battle was won. Yeah. It was. And, and it, it's a tragedy that in India, when we make movies on these historical subjects, it's a bit over the top. It's sort of completely, again, it turns human beings into caricatures. It turns them into these these sort of, you know, chase language spouting, always noble thoughts thinking uh, characters. Whereas, no, you know, they were real people who were doing real political things. Uh, it had a lot of like... And both grime. sides are killers. Of, yeah. I mean... You, there's no really virtu- uh, virtuous sort of behavior there. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, you're, you're killing fellow man over a piece of land. That's all it boils down to. But, uh, but I, why do thing, we do... right? Like the world was a very violent place till 100 years ago. You know, even the British, so much for them coming to civilize India. One of their favorite, favorite ways of, you know, executing Indians who were treasonous or, or seditious or whatever was to tie them to the mouth of a cannon and basically blow them out. Yeah. And and the thing is, it would your, your body would explode essentially and your flesh would sort of land in chunks all over. Over the countryside uh, and it was it was a means and they called it a very humane form of ex- execution because a person didn't uh, live long enough to know what was happening to him it was instant death but for the people watching it was so horrifying that it would send a message through the community not to stand up to the british and it was this was brutal. Really civilizing india so you know there you go it was it was brutal and humane what a paradox and yeah. above <laughs> everything else it was not cost efficient see indians would never do this we would always be cost efficient I mean, one cannonball for one human life, that's stupid. I mean, mm. honestly, they could just put him inside the cannon and shut it. No money, uh, no cost to company, you know? <laughs> no, Wait but 45 that, minutes but to open it. You also want to demonstrate, like you want people to see the the, the kind of power you have. Uh, one, uh, there was this, chap, uh, this gentleman in Kerala who was very powerful in the early 19th century. And his he executed a, a person by basically tying one leg to one elephant, another to another elephant. Oh. And then the yeah. elephants are driven in opposite directions. That is a slow death because elephants don't walk very fast. So you're basically oh ripped apart rather slowly. The so this was, was done by with the Mongols and all, with the horses and stuff, right? But you take yeah. the four limbs and just... Oh, oh, oh. How, no, because power was very fragile in those days. No, if you had power, you had to be really brutal in sort of holding on to it. And, and brutality was a way to sort of secure your power. Now we have democratic institutions. Now we use our tongue and sort of debate rather than actually slaughter each other in the street. And that's how power is transferred through votes and ballot boxes. But till about 100 years it? ago, <laughs> well, no, but not entirely, but in great measure, the world for the first yeah. time has. Let's be positive. You're right. Yeah. As uh, Amit, our proprietor, or rather ex proprietor, says, this is the best times actually in civilization, in spite of all the internecine wars you yeah. see here yeah. and there. In, uh, is that right to say? 
20th overall, century. Yes. Overall, yes, more people are, are surviving into adulthood. Uh, people are living longer. People are dying of diabetes rather than and the you know, conflict uh, casualties uh, are less actually than they would be if you compare to World yeah. War One, World War Two, yeah. or even uh, Korea, Vietnam, those kind of things. Yeah, uh, and even India, the nature Pakistan, of warfare is know. changing, right? Like traditional wars are not how how war is even waged anymore. Like the U.S. and Afghanistan is an example. Now it's terrorism. It's these localized, highly sort of surgical kind of things that are happening, and that's probably going to keep uh, happening. Large deployments of armies are going to be a very rare thing, and it's going. It's to a bit unfair. Smaller. One side has drawn and they press buttons from say Washington or wherever yeah. and the other side has like rifles and they're looking into the sky and I mean, it's just unfair it is, yeah. people can't be 500 years behind the other people because that's just not a technology can't play such a big hand as it, yeah. it did in the Congress of India as well okay uh, let's get a couple more in so yes, sure, sure. Uh, the next one comes in from Kumar Kumar uh, he says this about Manu he says ah my favorite historian this man single-handedly made me fall in love with history <laughs> Uh, two questions to you. That's both. a huge tribute, Manu S. Pillai. Yeah, that's right. I, 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 I've never heard anyone say that about me. But then, what <laughs> would I make them fall in love with except hate? <laughs> yeah. Uh, he says, uh, two questions to both of you. Uh, what are your favorite historic moments? And second, which historic moment was most impactful? You know, I don't have moments. Again, I'm, I'm more interested in the characters in history because for me, they're just such well-formed human beings and so eccentric at times, so funny at times that it's the human beings that really matter to me rather than moments or individual things that th things that they achieve. Like, you know, Malik Ambar, the African man who fought the Mughals in the Deccan for 25 years, begins life in Ethiopia in the Oromo tribe as a random kid, gets kidnapped and is sold into slavery in Baghdad, gets shipped to India where another black man who's the minister of the Sultan of Ahmednagar buys him. Then a few years later, he's freed, becomes a local warlord, has just a few hundred people, sort of cavalrymen with him. The Mughal invasion of the Deccan in the, 70, in the 1590s creates a political vacuum, which he starts filling. Maratha start banding. Suddenly, he has 7,000 soldiers, 20,000 soldiers. Shivaji's grandfather is among his, his comrades. And, and he becomes a kingmaker, gets his daughter. This chap from Ethiopia, Oromo tribe, ends up here. His daughter marries the Sultan. Uh, he becomes the kingmaker. And for 25 years, he's standing wow. there. Ultimately, the, yeah, uh, the Mughal Emperor Jahangir is reduced to sort of sitting in Agra and calling him names like this disastrous man, this black-faced man, because he refuses to be defeated. And Jahangir commissions an, a painting in which he shows himself shooting an arrow at Malik Ambar's impaled head, which was something Jahangir never actually achieved in life. It was just an imagination or a wishful painting that Jahangir wanted to see, because in real life, Malik Ambar died secure in a fortress, a very rich and confident man in, in, the, in the 1620s. People like that tell you how much history has it, it how fascinating it is marathas joining an african muslim fighting for the deccan and this man didn't wasn't even born in india and he's fighting for the deccan against the mughals it tells you how complex and rich uh, history is and that's why i said if you focus on the characters you start seeing their worlds more more with, with greater sort of ease and when you see their worlds you realize just how am amazing history can be so you could say malik ambar lived the american dream for that time I mean, he comes from nowhere. He's an immigrant. Yeah. He doesn't speak the language. Next thing, he's yeah. top of the tree. And he, and the biggest force in the land can't quell him, no matter how they try. Yeah. And even yeah. when I say he came as a slave, these were not uh, slaves as in the American sense. They were military men. They were trained to come here and fight. They were not slaves in the in the sense that we use the term in more recent history. So I so what you're saying is this is a caste system in slavery? Or you could be like the right. Kshatriya slave? <laughs> yeah, because the thing is, and the thing is, these men, the local Rajas, often they didn't trust their own courtiers and they didn't trust their own generals. So they needed men who would be loyal just to the king. So African slaves who were brought here as military men with no contact with their home countries, nowhere to go, and uh, nothing other than the king's support ah. to fall back on, would be loyal to the throne. So, you know, that was the idea. Game of chess. Brutal again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. For me, I think, honestly, I don't know about you, Silvery, but there's so many moments in history one would like to be that fly in the wall who can listen and hear mm. and see what really happened. Like we mm. mentioned so many times, I'd love to know when he, cro uh, you know, after crossing, uh, 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 what is it, the Jhelum, the, the actual battle, did it really happen? And did it, does it really end in Alexander's favor? Who is this Puru guy who's never heard of after or mm. before? You know, that kind of thing. I would love to know um, what happened. Uh, well, we discussed this uh, before as well, after the Battle of Kalinga. 
you know this ridiculous story where he's just you know suddenly changes his mind and yeah. uh, says okay uh, i'm fulfilled piety and kindness and love milk of human kindness and i'm you know changing everything yeah but that's i don't mean debunked now because i think yeah, so, he was already but, 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 yeah but one would love to just see what really how that yeah. uh, thing yeah. transpires how political it is how machiavellian the thinking yeah. is etc etc and then uh, across you know i would love to know what happened at the end of hitler what really mm. happens you know i mean and how does he in the bunker, destroy poor blondie yeah. the german shepherd and, and eva braun mm. and then himself and his left arm had parkinson's proper where it was shaking completely if you study that at that point so he has to shoot himself mm. with only one functioning hand etc it would mm. have been easy so I, would, mm. i mean there's so many stories napoleon's death is always you know odd yeah. and my namesake who's uh, perhaps the most benevolent of all kings i would have liked to see what what was really going on in that court yeah. as well oh sire saukar okay wow yeah sire saukar sire saukar <laughs> who doesn't know anything about persian history what a break <laughs> to be born in delhi <laughs> it is so sad for him yeah all right should we take one more yes please uh, the next one comes from uday surya narayanan he says i have read south indian and uh, sorry i have read south indian historical icons like velu thampi and rani abakka in amar chitra katha comics and not in textbooks should amar chitra katha katha be introduced in schools at least in early classes what do you think no, i mean so long as you've been exposed to the story and it wets curiosity it doesn't matter where it comes from but you're right i mm-hmm. i think there is a uh, there is too much of a focus on north india which is true in in indian history not enough of a focus on some of these other subjects and other characters and other areas uh, but i wouldn't go so far for example right now on twitter i i've been seeing people saying oh, why do we study so much about the moguls and not about vijayanagara part of it is just practical the reason being that the moguls were there till 1858 so the kind of material and documentation available is very rich that's why you know whole decades have passed and people have still not fully exhausted studying the moguls vijayanagara was gone by the 17th century the material you have is more slender uh, as a result of which you know you don't know enough about that empire it's very, and it's more difficult to construct as detailed and as complicated a, an account as the moguls so some of that is also practical issues like that but yeah i i, I do hope that you know in school textbooks or at least through school teachers even if textbooks don't have it teachers should read more widely and sort of be able to make but, history but, a little more but manu what is wrong with uh, comics as when you're very young i'm not saying that you're studying in oxford cambridge and they're giving you amar chitra katha but to wet your appetite as that boy who mentioned that you know he's transformed into history buff because of you what yeah. is wrong in using you know okay. colored imagery easy language dramatize in that sense in the comic just introduce you to whoever the characters are and then the kid uh, as he grows older says okay i'm interested in this and then he'll read for himself so yeah, i am I, I, don't think I, i don't think there's anything wrong with it that's why i said so long as your exposure comes and it wets your appetite i'm not really i have no issue with where it comes from i'm not one of those orthodox people who say that it has to be like this very uh, high end book or whatever it can come from multiple ways my interest in history came from my grandmother telling me family gossip you know because i was just fascinated that she could be so transparent about her parents her uncles her aunts her grandparents and see them not as these you know figures as grandmother grandfather but as humans and it was it was it was so stunning it and i I've, i've been able to talk to her about fairly like uh let's say controversial things that people don't talk about in indian families i remember asking her that you know uh, she told me that in the household in which she grew up it was one of those old country agrarian households an establishment with lots of people but strangely no, not too many people had bedrooms to themselves people used to sleep all over the place uh, you know all the children would be in one room the the mother would be with them the father alone would be sort of on this big uh, uh, canopy bed in one of the rooms or whatever and i remember that's what happens <laughs> curiosity saying you know your parents produced eight children how did that even happen if your mother's here and you've never seen your mother and father together during the day they're never together and then she said and then she thought about it and she said that's true you know i've never really thought about it but now that i think of it every now and then at night i would wake up cold because my mother wouldn't be next to me so i'm guessing that's when uh, you know they would meet <laughs> or whatever but to me it's interesting you know in an agrarian joint family how did people mm-hmm. have intercourse it's a question that matters because yeah. you make sense of that world by asking these small questions by asking you know what is you know i remember going to the palace in trivandrum when i was doing my first book and on the first floor there were these doors that opened out into thin air you know you if you walked out of that door you'd fall down and die and i kept thinking why do they have doors like this on the first floor not opening into a balcony but just opening into the into the, into the, into the void and it turned out that it was because lower caste people had to come in and clean the palace toilets and and basically drain it and obviously they were not going to be taken in from inside from the main entrance so they would put a ladder open this door and enter oh the bathroom God. directly and then clean it ah small details like that can give you so much texture can give you so much insight into exactly how a palace operated 
uh, and and the casteism that exists in that that one door opening into thin air is a representative of the caste system you know so asking these small questions can sometimes you know matter and so let me ask you a small let me ask Sorry. you a small question manu if you were a king in those times would you keep a big harem well i mean it was harems were often by the way harems have been have been stereotyped into into this whole idea that the kings were just sleeping with all the women there some women were taken in for protection uh, you know widows older women etc some were there and they were often treated very well and with immense respect some of the women you wouldn't you wouldn't like dare stand or sit in their presence you'd be extremely respectful the dowagers of older kings etc a tremendous influence only a small section would be your associates and your concubines and so on uh and by no stretch are these british ideas that people had 3000 wives and 500 concubines what? and but 903 concubines no no, no. these true. are all he's my favorite all, how no. can he be my favorite <laughs> if it's less don't lessen the number of breaking my heart 200 <laughs> people in his harem but that doesn't mean he's sleeping with all of them each of them occupies different positions his grandfather's sisters his great aunts his mothers oh all god right. they better wait need that his man guy drinks too much he enters the harem and like you got to know who your relatives are oh my god this is horrible yeah. i got a new book for you <laughs> enter the harem <laughs> yeah. oh boy okay can we do can we do one last yeah. question yeah 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 uh rohit sharma has asked after working with shashi tharoor does manu have political ambitions of his own <laughs> very good I mean, point the thing is i don't have a famous last name i don't have a uh, lot come of on manu that, that, that you'll make it famous that, 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 that era that, 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 that era's gone no no i don't think i don't think i see myself uh, at least not anytime soon right now i've got my work cut out for me writing research history that's what i'm doing and you know uh, who knows what the future holds but no plans or anything but po- our politics is the history of the future you have a cho- choice you can we, we now cross become that politi- bridge when we get there if we ever get there so you're not saying completely no i'm not saying no because i mean i've worked in politics so i know a little bit about it and i am interested but i can't i can't opt for any traditional route for politics because it's not possible in india you need to have either cash well, and you get to the rajya sabha cash, as an eminent writer we get you in those 12 seats in the rajya sabha for eminence <laughs> you get in and then <laughs> if you have if you have such influence iris please do they have a very confused. good canteen you don't have to worry about policy I've making i will turn at the parliament so, so, ah, what am i saying you tell me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right okay uh, i think it's been a great session thank you so much manu um, the book is called uh, where is it false allies false alliance false alliance allies not alliance false allies not alliances i'm yeah. sorry i'm 50 years old and i can't find the damn paper which i kept from ah here it is uh, but all it says is washing hands for some reason <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> uh false allies were the british or the or the royalty of india uh more cunning to find out more you have to read the book and see that it was uh, a lot of this is based on sex and morality as well so it'll be very interesting read even if you're not a history buff um yeah i think sex sells you have to do that you have to do that <laughs> from time to time okay all right guys have a good day i am off you. to take photographs Thank with you. amit doshi for this podcast now right, i see you bye bye see you